Hello and welcome back to part 2 of the Thief Guide. In the previous episode, we looked at all Thief mechanics in nauseating detail. In this episode, we will look at practical applications of that information such as stabilizing a newly conquered Thief, avoiding rebellion, and unlocking a Thief's true income potential. I release 2 to 3 Bannerlord videos per week, so consider subscribing so you don't miss out. Timestamps are in the description, and let's go. Before we get into what to do after taking a Thief, it makes sense to look at a couple things we could do beforehand, like passing good policies, finding good governor companions, and taking a couple perks for our main character. When it comes to policies, there are three for loyalty and two for security that I recommend for any setup. There are other policies that are great under the right circumstances, but this small list is a great starting point. If you're a vassal and barely have enough influence for a single policy vote, then go for forgiveness of debts 100% of the time. Plus two loyalty is massive and we only take a 5% hit to our fief income. However, it can be tricky getting the votes to pass. In this case, none of the three loyalty policies have support, but bailiffs has well over 50% and magistrates 8%. Security is nice to have, but should be taken only after some of the loyalty policies are in place if possible. Trying to vote on the three loyalty policies, we see massive opposition for forgiveness of debts, which is a bit depressing. Tribunes of the People has only one opposing with a level 1 influence vote, so it will pass easily with a level 2 or level 3 vote from us. Trial by jury is the exact same story. The main takeaway here is that policies can pass even with no support, but we need to test each one to see which has staunch opposition and which will pass with some extra influence on our end. If you can't pass any of them, then save the influence and focus on grabbing a good early game governor companion or spouse. I highly recommend looking for someone of the same culture as the target thief and with 75 leadership or higher for heroic leadership or 150 archery or higher for discipline. The extra plus one loyalty from these perks is huge, especially for a thief of the correct culture. You won't know which perks they have until you can access their character screen, so feel free to hire and marry away. For companions, you can simply fire them. For a spouse, you can accidentally hit them in the face with a javelin over and over or send them into battle by themselves until they kick the bucket. The security perks are also helpful early on, and a lot of them will be accessible by most companions, so don't forget to level up those skills that are close to the perks. And finally, if you've put points into either charm or leadership, then these two perks are a must-have. 225 charm perk parade, which gives plus 5 loyalty per day while in the fief waiting, and 125 leadership presence, which gives plus 5 security per day while waiting. Now we've taken our first fief and need to stabilize it. Let's take stock of where we are and what steps are needed to move forward. The hardest scenario is starting with a town of a different culture from our own that is starving, like we can see here. Going to the manage town screen, we can see exactly what the next step should be. Raise loyalty at all costs. We won't have any help from kingdom policies, a governor, or personal perks for this scenario, so our only option here is to cancel all buildings and turn on festival and games. We can clear the building queue by selecting any building. Clicking the button on the right once followed by the button on the left. Now we have to make sure festival and games is activated at the bottom. If we do nothing else, we will add plus three loyalty per day, which is huge. Even if our town starves for the next year, they cannot rebel against us as our loyalty equilibrium will be well above 25. Waiting for a week, we can see loyalty settling at just below 50. There is no risk of rebellion and we can safely leave the fief if need be. We have a couple options moving forward. We could cut some of the garrisons so that we earn a profit from the thief and come back later once we have better loyalty bonuses or we can try and fix things right now. Personally, I think leaving the thief as is would be best until we can get some bonuses, but let's try it both ways so you can see. In order to get this town in good shape, we need to improve loyalty first, which means we upgrade the fairgrounds. Switching over to the building, we can see loyalty go negative by more than minus three, which will push us close to rebellion territory. Also keep in mind the closer to 25 we go, the closer to zero construction we get, slowing down building significantly. It says 27 days to completion, but remember we lose construction each day because loyalty is decreasing. Moving forward 10 days, our loyalty has dropped to 27 and we are losing 36 construction from low loyalty, which means our time to complete has actually gone up to 34 days. In order to counteract this, we need to cycle festival and games on and off, stay away from 25 loyalty, and keep construction high. We turn off the building, wait 10 more days, and we are at 39 loyalty 
loyalty now. Switching back to the building, now it only takes 23 days to complete. We let another 10 days pass, but this time loyalty drops to below 25, meaning construction is at zero now, and we are at risk of rebellion if we are not personally inside the town. Now we wait for 30 days until loyalty is near 50 and try it again, but now it's only 13 days to complete. It took another 30 days to finish for a grand total of 90 days. Not only that, but we had to babysit the town until finishing or risk rebellion. Now we have to repeat this cycle of building, then festival and games until we can finish the fairgrounds to level 3. Time to find a new wife. This one stopped working. It took just over 60 days to complete the next level, even though it cost more construction. The difference is the extra 0.5 loyalty from fairgrounds, pushing us further away from 25 loyalty. We finished fairgrounds level 3 in just under 60 days. This demonstrates perfectly how powerful having a little bit more loyalty is. Let's go back to the beginning and take a different road. We leave the town alone for now and come back with a Vlandian governor. We don't even need a good one, just one that's the same culture. In this case, Davobard the Grizzled happens to have a couple security perks, but he is by no means a good governor. All we care about is the plus one from the same culture. The expected completion time is 26 days, but this will increase since loyalty will go down once we start. It takes 36 days this time, compared to the 90 days it took before without the governor. Level 2 fairgrounds completes in about 47 days instead of 60 without the governor, and level 3 in just 52 days instead of 60. It's also worth noting, we were not in danger of rebellion once, and didn't have to micromanage the festival and games on and off. What a huge difference. Let's repeat the process once more using only the two main character perks. Starting off, we see a massive plus 5 security and plus 1 to loyalty even at 47 while building the fairgrounds. We will stay above 50 and avoid the construction penalty for sure. 27 days later and this building is completed. Not only did we avoid going below 50, we actually went above 75 while building, giving a small boost to construction. We finished level 2 in 46 days and level 3 in the same. High loyalty is OP. Let's recap the most important points here. Focus on loyalty above all else with the goal of being at or above 50. If loyalty is close to 25, turn off all building projects and turn on festival and games. If we have anything to help boost loyalty such as kingdom policies, same culture governor, or personal perks, then proceed to max out fairgrounds or until you can hit 100 loyalty without festival and games on. The previous scenario was certainly not ideal, but it could get a lot worse. Let's look at a worst case scenario. A high prosperity town with no food, no garrison, and all villages recovering from a raid. Looking at the town management, we see everything but prosperity is zero. Even our loyalty is stuck at zero with no expected change. Once again, we will not be using policies, governors, or personal perks to help here. Let's turn off all buildings and turn on festival and games. Immediately we see a plus three loyalty, which will help us get out of rebellion territory. The food situation is not looking good as we are gaining only 17 total but are losing 175 per day. Two big issues here. We need caravans to come back into the city and resupply us and we need time for the villages to recover after being raided so they can supply us with food. As long as we avoid being sieged, caravans will swarm us shortly to restock our food. We can also help by carrying around a couple thousand grain to sell. We go to the market, sell as much grain as we are comfortable with and wait for one day for the food tick to happen. After selling only 2,000 grain, we can see 105 food being consumed, which will slow down the prosperity loss significantly. Finally, let's look at security. We have no garrison currently, so we aren't gaining security from anything other than drift. We could put some troops into the garrison, but they will consume food and drive prosperity down further. Instead, let's wait a few days for our villages to come back online, and then we can place troops in the garrison. After a few days, we can see a much better picture. We are still gaining close to one loyalty per day, so getting above 25 won't be an issue. Food is still negative, but all four of our villages are back to work and providing food once more. To combat this, we can supply the town manually with grain, upgrade the orchard, or increase village hearths until each village gets to level 3. Loyalty is below 25, so leaving the town to buy more grain is not an option. Remember, rebellions cannot spawn if your main character is present in the town, no matter how many troops you have. Our construction is at zero due to low loyalty, so orchard upgrade is not an option either. Switching to hearth growth could be an option, however we still need festival and games for the loyalty gain. So for now, we will let our people starve. Next, we look at security. Fortunately, we don't have to deal with any bandit bases or notable quests, so we just need to wait a little longer for caravans to resupply the town with food before we can start the garrison. At zero security, we get minus two to loyalty, so even raising security by a small amount will make a massive difference to the loyalty equilibrium. Only a couple days later and we are in the green for the first time with food. Now we can build up the garrison, which we do by 
by placing the highest tier troops first since they will provide the highest security gain and consume the same amount of food as tier 1 troops. I like to put 25 to 50 at a time and check how much food is left. As long as we aren't losing food, then we are in good shape. Getting off of zero security will partially remove the minus 2 loyalty hit which in turn will raise our construction and everything else with it. Don't forget to turn off auto recruitment. We don't need tier 1 trash eating up the food as we can continue to put higher tier troops as the food supply expands. After waiting only 10 days, we see 36 loyalty and 13 security which means we are out of the rebellion risk and can start building. The food supply has gone up again so we deposit a few more high tier troops. At this point the town is stable and we can safely leave without fear of rebellions. Adding in any sort of assistance from policies, perks, or governors makes avoiding rebellions almost trivial. Let's look at the key points here. As long as we are in the town with our main character, the town cannot rebel so we stay inside as long as it takes. Focus on raising loyalty first. Clear the building queue and turn festival and games on until safely above 25 loyalty. Keep plenty of spare grain to sell as it can help slow prosperity loss while we wait for villages to recover. Being patient is key. It takes time for food to recover so waiting in town for days or even weeks may be necessary. Don't forget to clear quests from towns and bound villages. Many non-gang leader quests will hurt security, loyalty, and prosperity so be sure to clear them when possible. Just keep in mind below 25 loyalty and you do run the risk of a rebellion as soon as you leave the town. Once the town is stabilized, we have several options for moving forward. We can leave it be for now and come back to it later, maximize prosperity gain for income, or fortify the defenses to avoid being taken back by the enemy. Most of the time, raising defenses should be the choice since recent conquests will be targeted by the enemy. We have three ways of increasing the defenses in our fief. Increasing the garrison, the militia, or the walls. Fortunately, this town has level 3 walls already, but even if it did walls take a very long time to complete and our construction would take a hit from going below 50 loyalty. Raising the garrison isn't a good option either since the town is already close to break even with food as it is. The best option is to boost militia. We turn on train militia from the daily defaults which provides a plus 3 to militia production. Right now we are at plus 4.56 per day but as soon as we switch off of the train militia that number will drop to 1.56. We will want to build a militia grounds as well so we build up militia until we get close to plus 3 3.0 and then start the building. If we go to less than 3, we will start to lose militia, which is counterproductive. After a few days of waiting, we are at 0.03 militia when switching off, which is right at the equilibrium point we want. We start the militia grounds and finish it 19 days later. Now we turn train militia back on until we reach 3 and then upgrade militia grounds again. Notice our food production has picked up as well, meaning we can hire troops and mercenaries to boost the garrison as well. We finish off level 3 militia grounds, which means we can leave train militia on until the town is safe. After a few weeks we hit nearly 500 militia and still have 0.79 to go. Between the garrison and militia the enemy will have to get through 1,000 troops and tier 3 walls. Let's recap the defensive strategy. First we stabilize the fief's loyalty. Next we turn on train militia daily default and build up the militia. If we have enough loyalty to build we start militia grounds once we hit 3 militia and repeat until level 3 militia grounds. Periodically fill the garrison with hired mercenaries and recruited troops as food supply allows. Finally, we leave train militia daily default on until the town is no longer in danger of attack. Playing defense is fine, but it's no way to live our life. Now we switch over to max prosperity so we can fund any army and continue taking more fiefs. We will start from zero once again, but this time we will take several good governors and the two personal perk presents and parade to help us along. We have six asteroid governors we can pick from, but only two that we plan to use. Bilia, the engineer, will help when we are constructing buildings and Darim of the Wastes will help us when we run the daily default. Darim is up first because we want to recover loyalty as fast as possible and he has the plus one loyalty, same culture bonus, as well as the plus one from level 75 leadership perk, giving a plus two loyalty total. The sooner we reach 100 loyalty, the sooner we max out our construction output and the quicker we can start building. We only have to wait 22 days before we reach loyalty 100. We're currently at 3.18, but if we switch off of festival and games and change governor to the engineer we will lose five. We want to be as close to 100 as possible for the construction bonus and we still have one level of fairgrounds to upgrade so we put the engineer in for an extra 40 construction output and begin. Fortunately we got a small loan of a million dollars and could fund the reserves. 
21 days later we finish and have just enough to stay at 100. Next we need to decide the best way to increase prosperity. Aside from perks and policies there are three main ways to do it. Upgrade the aqueduct, upgrade the orchard, and increase the village hearths. The aqueduct provides a direct bonus to prosperity gain while the other two provide more food production which in turn provides more prosperity gain once the food stores are maxed out. The aqueduct provides 0.3 prosperity gain in 10 days building time. The orchard provides plus 6 food or 0.6 prosperity gain after 10 days of building. Finally, each village provides plus 6 food for each tier that they reach. Yachasmin is at 426 and will reach the next level at 600 or 174 prosperity more. With irrigation on, this village will have 1.4 per day and will take 125 days to upgrade. Khamoshawat is at 155 and needs 200 for the next tier or 45 more. At plus 1.6 per day, it will take 29 days to upgrade. Mijayit just hit level 2 and is nowhere near upgrading soon and Nakhlan is 40 away or 25 days. At only 10 days to complete, the orchard provides the best prosperity gain in the shortest time, so we proceed with that upgrade. The level 2 upgrade will take 16 days, and the math is not far off from the villages as before, so we upgrade the orchard again. For level 3, it will take 20 days to complete, which means irrigation is the move until the two smaller villages hit level 2 at 200 hearths. Also keep an eye out for certain quests. Artisans can't sell, give a minus 2 prosperity per day modifier, and we can clear it instantly. We accept the quest, but then agree agree with the merchants to make it fail on purpose. There is a small hit to relations, but it doesn't matter because they will increase over time because we have high security anyways. While we're down here watching our villages reach 200, we need to talk about bandits. If our villagers get captured while traveling to and from the town, we will not only lose the money they were carrying, but also 0.5 hearths per villager when they respawn. To combat this, we need to periodically clear out the area or set up a companion party to do it for us. Setting them to defensive and giving them Calvary only will make cleaning up local bandits a breeze. 20 days later and both villages have reached level 2. So we head back to town. We are still more than 100 days away from reaching level 3 with the highest hearth village. So back to upgrading the orchard we go. One quick note, if you create a companion party, expect them to drop up troops to the garrison. We want our food excess to stay at the max, so we will clear the garrison out and reduce the garrison wage cap to 100. This should dissuade them from doing it again. For the next upgrade, we go with the aqueduct. It only gives half the benefit of upgrading a village, but at 10 days upgrade time, the math works out better this way still. The same logic applies for level 2 and level 3, taking a total of 35 days to complete both and increasing prosperity by 0.7. All it's left is to turn irrigation on and we will be at max food in about two and a half years. Don't forget to clear out bandits from time to time as losing villagers will set us back about a week or two for each party lost. At some point we also need to upgrade the marketplace to level 3 to increase the tax income. Once all four villages are level 3 we will see a plus 18 from each. It's a beautiful sight. Now we just need more time for prosperity to pile up. To speed it up just a tiny bit more we can turn on housing for plus one prosperity gain. One final thing we can do is assign a high level steward governor. There are a few good perks in steward but 275 is the massive one and can add about 50% to the prosperity tax gain. Once we hit 12,000 prosperity, our income from the town reaches 8,500 per day. If we add back in the tariffs and the village income, we can easily break the 10,000 per day mark, all from one single town. This was a big section, so let's recap. To reach max prosperity, we need to upgrade the orchards, villages, and aqueducts. The order in which each is done should be calculated manually as each town and village will be different for different campaigns. Keep the area clear of bandits as losing villager parties can cost us hearths. Upgrading the marketplace, keeping security and loyalty at 100, and having a level 275 steward governor can nearly double the income of any fief. As we can see from the last example, the prosperity max is determined by food, which means fiefs with more bound villages can reach significantly higher levels of prosperity. There are only four towns in the game with four bound villages, and I highly recommend taking these for yourself when possible. Volandia has Jackalon, Batania has Maranath and Sionan, and Asarai has Sanala. Now that we know exactly how to build up a fief to great heights, it's immediately obvious what steps are needed to tear them down as well. Take Vostrum as an example. It starts out as one of the highest prosperity towns in the game. Let's see how much damage we can do to the income with a small force. With 100 loyalty and security, the income caps out at 2231 for the town and about 550 between the bound villages and tariffs. After raiding villages, destroying 
destroying villager parties, taking village hearths down to zero, and preventing most caravans from selling food to the city, we lowered the prosperity to below 2,000 and the income to roughly 900 per day. That's one third of what it was before and will significantly damage the owner clan's wealth. If the loyalty goes down below 25, then nearly all income is cut off and the town becomes a huge expense. This strategy is particularly effective against fiefs that have the minus three loyalty malice from having a different culture and will likely rebel because of it. There is one correction that needs to be made from the previous guide. Daily defaults show a scaling with construction on the building information, but it actually provides a flat amount regardless of prosperity or construction. Plus one prosperity, plus three militia, plus three loyalty, and plus one hearths. The reserve fund does not affect the output either. Tail World's math wins this day. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this video. Thank you for watching and have a great week.